Uh, so thank you everyone for coming today um, to the next practical technologies uh, session on novel sensors. Uh, today we'll be hearing from Professor Doris Gadella and Dr. Jim Rowe about uh, fluorescent biosensors. Um, so thank you to both of our, uh, our wonderful speakers. I'll introduce them um, as they give their talks and um, to all of you for attending as well. To get started, uh, Dr. Jim Rowe is a postdoc in the lab of Alexander Jones at the Sainsbury Lab uh, at the University of Cambridge. He's previously worked in the labs of Keith Lindsay in Durham and Stuart Casson in Sheffield. His work focuses on environmental regulation of plant development, and today he's going to be talking to us about uh, the use of fluorescent biosensors in his work. So, um, Jim, I will pass on to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I thought today I'd give it a bit, bit of an overview and talk about how we can use um, biosensors to do uh, to produce more quantitative uh, biology, uh, particularly genetically encoded fluorescent biosensors. Um, I'm going to give a bit of background to different type of fluorescent types of fluorescent reporters. Um, it's quite a long history now, um, and um, after that, uh, hopefully I'll convince you of the benefits of using um, direct biosensors uh, to uh, measure our analytes of in interest and how we can use those to actually start pulling apart biochemistry or signaling in vivo. Um, which of course has uh, implications for like understanding how um, plants work or how any organism works really, um, and has implications for modeling. Then I've got a few tips for getting started on biosensor imaging and uh, talk through some of the, the pitfalls that may come about. And um, hopefully we'll have a discussion about how advanced image analysis can be used to get more information from the biosensors. Um, so, uh, Fluorescent report systems, I think, can broadly be characterized in two different ways. They can either be intentiometric or ratiometric. Um, an intentiometric um, sensor or reporter is something where the um, fluorescence chain uh, brightness changes um, should reflect the uh, concentration or the presence of the analyte that you're interested in. Um, a ratiometric sensor, you actually um, you measure two different um, fluorescent spectra. And by taking the ratio of the two of them, um, you can get an insight into the um, presence of your analyte. Um, and this is really nice because it allows you to overcome expression differences and optical artifacts and stuff. Um, there are, like, there's a long history of uh, transcription uh, of fluorescent reporters um, from transcriptional reporters. Um, such as DR5, Degron reporters, such as D2 Venus, and then direct biosensors that interact with um, the uh, analyte directly, which can be intrinsic or extrinsic. Um, so um, I think most people listening will be familiar with transcriptional reporters at the very least. So in the case of plants, the most famous one is probably something called DR5, uh, which is really a um, auxin responsive promoter. Um, so what you have is you have um, this promoter, which uh, in the absence of auxin um, is inactive because of the presence of these aux IAA repressor proteins. Um, these are targeted for degradation by the um, auxin receptor complex in the presence of auxin, uh, which relieves the, uh, the repression um, to allow transcription, translation, fluorophore maturation, etc. Um, to eventually give fluorescence. Um, these are really great and um, meant that people for the first time could, for instance, with the auxin reporters, get an idea of where hormones were accumulating at the almost cellular level, um, which really allowed us to, um, well, I say us, people before me to um, really understand uh, hormone accumulations, tropisms, patterning and the like. Um, but they are quite slow. Um, which is why people then, uh, in subsequent years, develop things like Degron sensors, where you um, have a protein of interest that's broken down, a fluorescent protein that's broken down um, in the presence of your analyte. So here, it's the um, second domain of that um, aux IA repressor from the uh, previous slide, attached to a yellow fluorescent protein called Venus. In the presence of auxin, this is um, then tagged for degradation 
by the receptor complex. Um, in the, and it's degraded in the proteasome, so you get a drop in fluorescence, uh, indicating the presence of a hormone, the hormone. And the benefits of this, um, because it's a bit closer to the site of perception, means that you can um, you can really watch changes in fluorescence within minutes, as opposed to with the transcription uh, transcriptional um, fluorescent reporters such as DR5, which can take um, between uh, three and six hours for you to see your response when you add the hormone. Um, and this allows people to look at fast hormone uh, accumulations, for example. You can make these Degron sensors ratiometric as well by expressing a second non-degradable fluorescent protein. And then um, to quantify your auxin, you would take the ratio, the emissions of the two fluorescent proteins to get an indicator. Um, and this helps um, with tissue to tissue variation um, in expression. Um, and also uh, when you're imaging deeper tissues, things tend to be dimmer, so it helps account for that as well. Um, but for both of these different styles of reporters, they have several flaws. Uh, they don't tend to be very re reversible. They can take hours to revert after a stimulus. They also have very strong requirements of the endogenous machinery. So in this case, it would be the cases I talked about, it would be the um, endogenous auxin receptors, the expressions of which and exactly which receptors there are may vary from tissue to tissue. So ideally what we want is we want something where we can get a fluorescent output from a direct interaction with the analyte of interest. Um, and this is really what direct biosensors give us. They can often be also reversible. The responses, because it's direct, is often very fast and the reversibility can be fast as well. And they're quite often ratiometric, helping to account for some of these optical problems and um, expression level problems as well. There's a few different types of, well, there's a lot of different types of uh, fluorescent biosensors, but I think you can characterize them as ex intrinsic and extrinsic. So row GAFP is a great example of an intrinsic biosensor. So here, the fluorescent protein itself is sensitive to the analyte, which in this case is the um, oxidation status. So if you take row GFP and put it in a uh, reducing environment, you can shine a blue light laser, 488 nanometers on it, um, and you get a lot of green fluorescence. If you transfer it to an oxidizing environment, this means you get disulfide bond formation on the beta barrel, um, which means that you get a lot less green fluorescence with a 488 laser. Interestingly, there isn't much uh, fluorescence difference if you excite the GFP between the two environments with a 405 laser. So it becomes ratiometric when you compare the emission with a 488 over 405. And this can give very fast responses um, and allow you to measure things at high spatial temporal resolution. We also have extrinsic biosensors. So these are uh, biosensors with a separate sensory domain. Um, so a great example of this is the biosensor that I work on, which is called Abacus. So Abacus consists of a, a couple of fluorescence domains and a sensory domain. The sensory domain contains the ABA receptor pill 1 and its co-receptor ABI1, or at least a truncation of it. And these two domains, the pill 1 and the ABI1, um, only interact in the presence of ABA. Um, which means you can get quite a large conformation or change in the protein depending on if the analyte, ABA, is there or not. But how do we translate that conformational change into something that we can measure with a fluorescent microscope? Well, we rely upon a uh, phenomenon called FRET. FRET is an energy transfer between compatible fluorophores such as CFP and YFP. So these are most often fluorophores with overlapping emission and excitation spectra. And what this means is you excite your CFP, and if the CFP and the YFP are really close and in the right orientation, some of the energy will be transferred from the CFP to the YFP and fluoresce out in yellow instead of blue. But the amount of this energy transfer is tremendously sensitive to the, the distance and the angle of the two fluorophores. So when you have a large conformational change, such as upon ABA binding, what that means is that you get a big difference in the fluorescent properties of the sensor. So by dividing the, the YFP emission 
over the CFP emission, you can get a proxy for the concentration of ABA. And this can be done at really high spatial temporal resolution. You know, we can um, take an Arabidopsis route in this case, and we can give it pulses for only 10 to 15 minutes of dis different concentrations of ABA, and we can get very quantitative outputs from this. Um, so we can start to see the rates of uptake and the rates of depletion with these different treatments. What's interesting is that um, when you do these repeated pulses, the rate of um, ABA elimination actually accelerates. Um, it's eliminated more quickly after pretreatment with ABA, which implies that ABA is promoting its own elimination, which could be through conjugation or degradation or something else. But we don't have to be limited to just look at the hormone we are interested in itself. We can also look upstream. So um, Annalisa in the Jones group here has been using the GA4 biosensor GPS-1, which works in a very similar way to Abacus and has a positive ratio change on hormone binding uh, to understand the, the GA biosynthesis pathway and how it helps produce patterning in Arabidopsis roots. And here what she found was that the step that in the literature was pointed out as the uh, rate limiting step, which is the GA20 ox, catalyzed step when she induced biosynthesis actually didn't make much of a difference in terms of the amount of GA in a root but actually the later step the GA3 ox catalyzed step caused a massive difference in the elongation zone here when compared to the wild type and in fact if you overexpress both enzymes in an inducible manner what you see is that you actually get um, accumulation here in the meristematic zone um, indicating that in this region, further up the route, GA3-OX is limiting of GA accumulation, whereas further down the route, it's GA20 and GA3-OX. And this allow, you know, this tool set where you can induce expression of enzymes, use mutants, and add precursors gives you a lot of power to really dissect biochemical pathways. And not just that, but you can use, um, that's only with one biosensor. Uh, if you take a signaling integration system, such as, um, uh, stomatal closure, which is a wonderful model, what you find is that you have interactive signaling between ROS and calcium, ABA, and um, the action of the kinase OST1. And we now have fast and good biosensors for each of these, allowing people to unpick complex signaling networks, which is really a boon for the community. Hopefully I've convinced you that biosensors can offer a lot a lot when compared to uh, traditional transcriptional reporters. But really, I imagine there's a lot of people in the audience who are interested in getting started with biosensors. And um, to do that, I think you really need four things. You need a good sensor, um, an appropriate microscope, a good protocol, and a good analysis pipeline. Um, and I'm going to briefly talk about all of them so that um, you can think about the important things if you do decide that you want to do some biosensor imaging. So when you're choosing your biosensor, you have to think about a lot of different things. So one of which is the spectral properties. It's pointless having an RFP biosensor if you don't have a red fluorescent microscope, for example. You are often looking for biosensors with high signal to noise, which makes the microscopy a lot easier. Does the biosensor bind the analyte in the right physiological range? So is it high enough affinity, for example, for your hormone to, um, to detect the low concentrations of the hormone? We often look for orthogonality. Um, so does it interact with endogenous signaling or processes? And also do those processes interact with it and give you spurious um, readings? You then need to think about expression in terms of there are a lot of biosensors that are quite difficult to express constitutively, um, which can cause a lot of problems. It's a lot easier to do imaging if you can see the thing. <laughs> And then the other thing you need to think about is having an appropriate microscope for the spectral properties. So yeah, having a, the right microscope is really important. It doesn't have to be the fanciest confocal in the world. Uh, if you've got a very good epifluorescence with good uh, filter set and a good sen uh, set of sensors or cameras, then you can do wonderful biosensor imaging. But what is important is to have those sensitive detectors and to have appropriate excitation and emission filters or spectra. 
So for CFP, YFP, FRET, for example, most microscopes as standard don't come with a laser in the sort of 430 to 440 range, which is what you really need. And also you need to be able to measure emission in the sort of 535 range, which is again, not always standard. And I would ad always advise anyone, uh, if you're thinking about getting a biosensor in and doing some, um, some of this sort of imaging to have a chat with your imaging facility manager. It's one of the most helpful and useful things you can do because they've often had experience with this sort of imaging before. Once you've got your biosensor and you've got your microscope and you know that the two together will work, it's a good idea to have a look at some of the imaging protocols that are out there already. And I can really recommend this one by uh, Annalisa in our group for CFP, YFP imaging. They will describe a lot of the pitfalls that people regularly fall into with these different biosensors. Um, things you need to be careful of, for example, are avoiding saturation or dim signal in your samples and avoiding interpreting that to make sure you acquire images in 12, uh, like the highest bit rate possible so that they're more quantitative. Um, so the 12 or 16 bit is normal. And to try and keep your detector gain even between acquisition channels. Again, once you've got a protocol, it's worth asking your imaging facility manager for a bit of advice or other people who've done biosensor imaging in your, um, in your institute. Um, there's a whole wealth of advice out there you can get. Once you've done that, and you've got your first images and stuff, you need to start thinking about how you're going to analyze your data, um, which is often no small task. Um, a typical analysis pipeline consists broadly of pre-processing and segmentation and quantification steps. So you might blur objects to remove noise, uh, perform a background subtraction, separate out different channels, remove hot saturated pixels. Then you want to separate out your objects from the background. Uh, this is called segmentation. Um, this is important so that you're not analyzing artifacts. And this allows, uh, so a typical thing might be thresholding, object splitting, con connected component analysis. And then you perform the quantification itself, which is quite often calculating ratios. But you might also want to calculate, in this case, it's a nuclear sensor, so you might want the size and the position of each of these individual uh, nuclei um, or the connectivity of cells or whatever, you know. And you can do all of these steps in Fiji, but having a good analysis protocol and good analysis tools will mean that rather than clicking through each of these individual steps, which might take you hours for your, each image, um, you might be able to analyze it in minutes, which is why we spend a lot of time developing tools that allow you to do this as well. So this is a um, tool that I recently developed called Fretinator, which um, you can download for free if you've got punctate nuclear uh, markers, for example, to analyze them. And once you've got these sorts of fast 3D or 4D segmentation methods, it will speed up your analysis pipelines immeasurably. Um, and so what you're looking for is things that produce good segmentations quickly, um, export your data in an easy to use format, and then maybe allow you to quantify different regions, different cell types, exactly. This is my tool, but there are various others out there. Um, so this is this is good for punctate nuclei, but there's also stuff out there for um, like working in Gertart, for example, for, um, for quantifying diffuse sensors in uh, cytoplasm and stuff with really nice uh, image J tool sets or even comprehensive tool sets for uh, advanced image analysis like uh, morphographics, which gives powerful and flexible um, segmentation tools. And I would really advise you to investigate uh, the best ways of analyzing your images. Because once you can perform this sort of in-depth analysis, um, get quantitative spatial readouts of accumulations, dynamics, and the like, you can use these to inform spatial models and help close the gap between um, modeling and experimentation. And I think I'm going to call it a close there and thank um, uh, Alexander, my boss, and Annalisa from our lab for letting me use some of uh, her figures. Um, and thank you. Uh, so, yeah, thank you for um, that really fantastic overview. I think that's going to lead quite nicely, hopefully, into uh, Doris's talk as well. So just to introduce our second speaker for today, uh, Doris Gadella is, obtained his PhD from the University of Utrecht, followed by postdoctoral positions at the Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry in Gottingen and Wageningen University. He became an assistant professor in 1999 
And in 2009, he co-founded the Van Leeuwenhoek Center for Advanced Microscopy in Amsterdam, where he is now director. And Doris's work has focused on uh, a number of different things, but um, he's well known for, for his work on fluorescent biosensors. So it's um, really great to be able to have him to talk to us today. Uh, so thanks very much for inviting me and having me uh, present uh, this. And um, yeah, I will go to some recent things uh, uh, we did in uh, from Amsterdam, give some overview uh, about some things, but I know it's a bit limited to, to cover this in, in, uh, in, in 20 minutes or so. But uh, okay, so let's start. The, um, as we all know, GFP probably doesn't need an introduction. It's um, a jellyfish um, derived protein, nice uh, beta barrel fold. And the interesting thing, I think most interesting aspect is it's fully genetically encoded. So you can fuse the DNA to the DNA of any protein of interest and then create fusion proteins that are then expressed in cells that otherwise are just transparent, at least mammalian cells. And then uh, they light up in green colors. And, and this is a fantastic technology that really completely transformed cell biology. And as you all know, there have been a number of color variants that have been produced. And so the wild type, Echoria victoria, GFP, has this uh, three amino acid form in chromophore with a tyrosine notably uh, as part of it. And this will form a kind of phenolate anion, uh, which then is responsible for the green fluorescence. And this is also uh, the form that absorbs blue. And if it is protonated, it absorbs violet light. And this equilibrium can also be used for pH sensing. And as we also saw in the previous talk, uh, for uh, radox sensing if it is tweaked uh, in, in, in a certain way. But uh, also importantly, as pioneered by Roger Chen uh, in San Diego, uh, he uh, substituted the, the tyrosine residue for uh, histidine, tr uh, tryptophan, uh, and then he got different colors like the blue fluorescent protein, cyan fluorescent protein, which is an indole moiety you can, you can still recognize from the tryptophan. Uh, introduced. And this was inspired from the crystal structure that yields a yellow fluorescent protein where you introduce another amino acid, not part of the chromophore, but above the chromophore tyrosine, you get pi pi stacking in a 30 to 40 nanometers redshift. So these are the Aquaria Victoria colliver variants. And uh, in typically in optimizing fluorescent proteins, so our, our lab has contributed to mainly to two of them uh, uh, specifically, which I would like to cover in the next uh, few uh, minutes, is that you start to fill around with the DNA. So you can introduce certain changes and create libraries, for instance, mutated uh, completely around one amino acid position. So you can order DNA with degenerate uh, 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 yeah, codon usage. And then you can um, transform bacteria and plate them out on petri dishes. And then here you see individual colonies and each colony expresses then a unique variant uh, uh, with a specific amino acid uh, at this position or other changes. And in principle, you then you start to screen, uh, do we think it is bright or photostable or uh, et cetera? And then based on conclusions, you can then go back to the DNA, perhaps combine certain mutations or start to mutagenize further until you basically end up with a super uh, nice fluorescent protein. So we did some screening, but not based on fluorescence intensity as most other labs did, but we screened on fluorescence lifetime. And as you can see over here, we, uh, we made a high-end adaptation to our microscope. So we mounted a, a poster tube of 80 centimeters. And on top of that, we can just put the Petri dish and then you can remove the objective from the microscope from the objective turf and just place a single lens with an 80 centimeter focal distance. And because most uh, wide field microscopes nowadays have uh, uh, infinity optics. So basically you just need to cover this focal distance by a single lens. And then we very nicely can image the entire Petri dish. The NA, by the way, numerical aperture is horribly low, but okay, because these are typically bright bacteria, you don't mind uh, so much and they don't move. So you can integrate this for as long as you want, but within a second or, or five or something, you can have a nice 
image and also lifetime image. But what is now so interesting about the lifetime is that we find a few colonies that have a really changed fluorescence lifetime, an increased fluorescence lifetime. We were highly interested in it because the fluorescence lifetime, the excited state lifetime, the time the molecule spends in the excited state, so typically in the order of nanoseconds, you can see the scale over there from two to four nanoseconds. So the, the lifetime is proportional to the fluorescence chronomere or the efficiency of fluorescence. Whereas the intensity, of course, is also dependent on the quantum yield, but it also depends on other factors like the thickness of the colonies, the amount of factor that is uh, uh, absorbed, the, the maturation, the, pro, uh, the amount of protein, all sorts of factors that are interesting, but we were specifically interested in trying to increase the intrinsic quantum yield of the fluorescence. And for that, the lifetime screen provided a very nice contrast because you would never pick this colony from the plate uh, if you are only looking at fluorescence intensity. And that's why many labs in the end have um, found intermediate uh, fluorescence proteins that do, for instance, uh, maturate very well, so fold very quickly, but don't have the highest intrinsic uh, brightness or quantum yield. Well, here you see a result of CFP, the cyan fluorescent protein optimization. So these are all cyan fluorescent proteins with this tryptophan moiety in the chromophore. And we can recognize eCFP and cerulean, but there are some and seriously enhanced variants like m turquoise and m turquoise 2 which has an additional mutation that slightly further increases the lifetime. This is a T65S muta mutation, and, and this is a, a further mutation uh, in position 146, which then uh, creates a kind of maximal fluorescence. And it also ended up to have a quantum yield of 93%. So the fluorescence process is very efficient. 93% of the photons that are absorbed by the fluor for are even are put out as fluorescent, as cyan photons. So this is really great. And uh, it also had a phenomenally high fluorescence lifetime, single exponential. And the, this is very interesting for threat analysis. So for, for instance, for screening uh, interactions. And uh, so the cerulean 3 also incorporated the turquoise uh, T65S mutation and has a kind of similar spectral properties as turquoise. However, there's one difference and it is this uh, photo bleaching uh, parameter. So if you just shine light on the molecule, it photo bleaches faster. It, and, so that's also why uh, if you only look at the, the, the absorption and the quantum yield, this is typically how people then calculate the brightness and then this is the only number they consider. So my advice is to look further than that. And this is for instance, what you then see is uh, do a photo bleaching experiment in white field and HALA cells, then the turquoise and turquoise two hardly bleach eh? and they uh, show the same line. We see a little bit of photochromicity and ECFP and, uh, and some other variants, but the, uh, um, the, the cerulean three uh, really uh, very rapidly fades. And you can easily see this if you compare uh, the two experiments side by side. And so with that knowledge, we also started to uh, mutate red fluorescent proteins. I think those are highly relevant for plant sciences because they emit in the orange, uh, uh, portion of the spectrum where there is typically minimal for autofluorescence in plants. But the problem with the red fluorescent proteins is that uh, they in nature are always found as oblique tetramers. And it was very difficult, a major effort by the Roger Chan lab to make them monomeric. And also other labs have tried to monomerize uh, red fluorescent proteins and optimize them. And, they all have these funny names like Tuck RFP or Ruby, Apple, Cherry, Kate. So it's a Russian effort. And they have more or less similar spectra, a high, typically well, a high extinction coefficient, but you can see the quantum yield is rather low. Uh, for instance, Cherry, only 20%. So if you, uh, every, uh, only one out of five photons absorbed produces an emission photon. And some of them have a rather high PK, which is also a bit of a problem in cells, uh, specifically for acidic organelles. And some of them have problem with maturation or they have very strange uh, photochromic or uh, behavior 
or even uh, a low photo stability. And this is all because all the optimization from the tetramer into the monomer basically created a lot, a large compromise. So we started with a completely synthetic template. I will not go into detail about that. And we then started screening for increased fluorescence lifetime instead of just increased brightness because we wanted to screen for high quantum yield monomeric fluorescent, uh, red fluorescent protein. So here are some variants. As you can see, they have all a very high lifetime, two to four nanoseconds over here. And also very nice brightness, high brightness, uh, comparable to the uh, dimer tomato, which is a particularly bright dimeric uh, red fluorescent protein developed in the Chan lab. But you can also very easily see the M cherry protein, which due to its low quantum yield also has a very low fluorescence lifetime. Uh, but it is a nice red fluorescent protein. We use it also a lot because it is a fast maturating and, and rather photostable uh, RFP. But some of the variants in house were uh, much brighter and also had a much higher lifetime. So in the end, we ended up with M scarlet, which is threefold brighter than cherry in cells. We were inspired by this bird that, by the way, occurs in the Kingdom of the Netherlands, but in South African uh, Caribbean islands. It's the scarlet ibis. And it's, uh, this color is really what you can see from the colonies that you grow on, 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 on agar plates. This is the absorption spectrum, emission spectrum, and it's a very nice red fluorescent protein. And we did also this analysis of brightness in cells where we co-expressed turquoise to a cyan fluorescent protein and a red fluorescent protein in exactly one-to-one -one ratio. There's also an anti fred linker uh, sequence there. So we could use the same vector also to screen in bacteria, but in mammalian cells, this is cleaved with the P2A sequence inserted there. So you get one standard turquoise protein and variable red fluorescent proteins. And then you really can see every dot here as a single cell. So large differences in expression level, but always the same ratio, what you would expect. And then it's very easy to see that the scarlet and scarlet eye, which is the fastest maturating of the series, is very much brighter than all the others. So these are uncorrected data. Ruby 3 is a bit uh, better excited under these conditions. You can correct for that. Uh, the, the, it just absorbs a bit better uh, for this microscope. And if you correct for that, the, the angle is slightly lower. But OK, you can clearly see the differences and also that the, the brightness is comparable to the diamond tomato and much higher than for cherry or other red fluorescent proteins. So it works really well in cells, uh, live act. Uh, we can stain as fusion protein or mitochondria, uh, uh, Golgi apparatus or uh, nuclei, uh, microtubules, and also uh, Golgi, uh, uh, sorry, peroxisomes. And what is very important is to test then this oligomerization. And we were very keen on that because we indeed wanted to have this strict monomer. A very good test of that is to fuse it straight to alpha tubulin. And this then incorporates into the microtubule uh, 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 lattice, basically. And if there is a slight tendency for dimerization, it will screw up the microtubule. And then you will not able to see microtubules at all. There's also some slight fa uh, faint cytosolic fluorescence, and these are the alpha beta tubulin dimers that just float around. But you can clearly see individual microtubules growing and shrinking. So, this is a very nice test, uh, which, for instance, we'll never see for dimer tomato or some slightly uh, residually dimeric uh, for some protein, like TAC RFP, for instance. And another very nice thing, so I can also uh, point you to the Etching website. They have a nice thing about uh, fluorescent proteins that you can download, brochure. So it's this OSER assay where you put the fluorescent protein with a tail inside the endoplasmic reticulum. And if there is a slight affinity for the fluorescent proteins, they will find each other, clock up, and then um, you will see a, 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 a yeah, whirl structures or OSA structures as we call them. And uh, for instance, for dimer tomato, which is a dimer, you expect this. So you can see that you don't see a normal endoplasmic reticulum in the cells. And, um, but for turquoise too, which is nicely monomeric, you see perfect, nice uh, endoplasmic reticulum and also a nice nuclear envelope staining, as you would expect for typical ER labeling. 
And this is the same for scarlet eye. It's also monomeric, but for instance, the monomeric M uh, MKO, which is orange fresh uh, protein, MKO kappa, is tabulated as monomeric protein, but it does not behave well in this OSER assay. So it is suspicious. There is some residual still dimerization going on. So that's why it's important to test these things really in cells. Uh, and uh, well, the, with Antoine Royan, a uh, colleague in France, uh, we solved the crystal structure. So you see nice, beautiful pink crystals that are formed by the scarlet. This is the, the beta barrel structure. And the trick is that the chromophore is completely planar, uh, completely flat in the inside the, the beta barrel. Superimposed in, 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 in cyan here is the cherry chromophore, which you can see is a bit banana shaped. And due to this extra strain on the chromophore in cherry, this, uh, we believe this causes the lower quantum yield. And so the scarlet is perfectly uh, stabilized by surrounding amino acids. So that's what required all the uh, intense mutagenesis to stabilize the straighten out the chromophore uh, nicely. And uh, so we got some nice feedback. We sent this through Edgene and it's, I think meanwhile has been shipped over 2000 times worldwide. Other groups also from uh, the UK were quite enthusiastic uh, for Scarlet as compared to other red fresen protein, for instance, in yeast or in, in, in worms and, and, and nematodes. Uh, so clear differences, you don't need uh, very, uh, yeah, this is a bit of overkill, like eight times uh, increased uh, fluorescence. But it's really good to, uh, to have uh, all these nice feedback. And I think many people have found it very, very useful. So Scarlet Eye is a bit brighter. We also have gone a bit further lately, and we hope to announce Scarlet 3 soon, which combines the ultra fast maturation with the uh, uh, extreme brightness of scarlet in, into one protein, and which uh, we we really uh, screened a lot also for all the other parameters. So general notes on choosing the best fluorescent proteins: don't only look for intrinsic brightness, uh, so the maximal absorbance times the quantum yield. So that's usually how they are tabulated in all sorts of reviews. I think this is really overrated. Because, for instance, the maximal absorbance or extinction coefficient is measured for recombinant proteins, typically, days after uh, maturation. So usually it's a max absorbance uh, for fully maturated fraction, but it may be different in your cells. So consider, do consider the maturation speed and the extent, the final extent of maturation. So that uh, the also folding chromophore formation determine this maturation. So look at the cellular brightness shortly after expression. High absorbance is less important than high quantum yield because you just can use a more intense laser. Yeah, if your extinction coefficient happens to be a bit lower, but quantum yield you cannot change in the microscope. Yeah, so after you have excited the molecule, the quantum yield determines how much fluorescence comes out of your FP. So focus, if you want to compare fluorescent proteins on studies that directly compare different fluorescent protein in the same systems and cell. So many of the labs that have contributed nice FPs, they typically describe their own FP, but then cite all the other values from literature. You should, I think it's really good to compare them directly side by side in, uh, in, the, in, in, in any publications. So look at the monomeric behavior in cells, not in gels, not in ultra centrifugation, not on gel filtration columns. This is nice, but typically the concentrations are much lower than found in cells. And then uh, you will find that they are monomeric, but uh, not strictly monomeric per se in cells in these systems. So this also assay is really, I think the standard right now. Check problems. There are many problems related to photostability or photochromic behavior. Certain red fluorescent proteins particularly switch to blue forms and back and forth. They can be turned off and turned on. It can also be used for super resolution, but in general for FRET sensors or biosensors, you don't want that the fluor force themselves uh, react strangely to light. I can always recommend to spend a bit of time to compare different fluorescent proteins in your own cells in your own lab before starting elaborate um, 
transformations of, 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 uh, of mice or plants. Uh, so first do the simple experiment and see whether your uh, probe or sensors are behaving normally in simple systems before going for the more difficult experiments. So you can look at the fpbase.org, which is an overview of all fluorescent proteins, very nice database. And also they have a, uh, uh, yeah, some tips in choosing lasers or even emission filters that fit well with your fluorescent proteins. So also look at the edging website. There is a nice, um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, piece that you can download. It's a PDF on fluorescent proteins. So this is one figure and that from my colleague, uh, Joachim Goethart, also explaining this difference between intrinsic brightness and uh, maturation or protein stability. For instance, if you have a low maturation, but a very high intrinsic brightness, as you can see, then you will end up with dim cells anyway. Or if your protein is not stable, it's just degraded quickly, you also end up with dim cells, even if you have a high intrinsic brightness. So that's why I think it's overrated in the literature, the intrinsic brightness. It is important because it will set kind of the stage for what is the maximal brightness that you could expect. Okay, uh, if time allows, I would like to go on a bit with uh, threat sensing. So we also, so this is the technique, I think has been explained, but we utilize this uh, same trick for, uh, for instance, looking at small GTPA signaling in uh, mammalian cells. So this is just a single polypeptide with uh, the small GTPA's uh, row A and a row A binding domain, PKN, which has no further activity, but it is just fused onto this cyan yellow um, uh, yeah, sensor domain. And in the GDP state, you have a low threat situation because the cyan and yellow fluorescent protein are yeah, in the wrong conformation for significant threat. But if the GDP is exchanged for GTP by a, a GEF yeah, and the, uh, activating row A, then the, this uh, domain will fold on top of it. And, and uh, then you get a, uh, a seriously enhanced threat and you can really see this. So this is the spectrum, the first spectrum that you get in the GDP, in the inactive state, low threat state. And this is the threat state. So it's a serious quenching of CFP and a huge sensitization of the yellow uh, fluor four. And this is basically the difference between the GDP and GDP, inactive and active state of the sensors. This is a great tool. And so this sensor was developed by Yi Wu and he was uh, nice to share it with us. And in our lab, we have cloned it also to the different variants of rho found in uh, mammalian cells. So rho A, rho B, and rho C, put it in mammalian cells, and then you can activate them. And so you perhaps know rho A signals through the, uh, to the actin cytoskeleton and is involved in uh, contraction and in stretch fiber formation. And what is so nice about this small GTPAs is that it basically signals uh, and, and you uh, towards the actin cytoskeleton, but in a way that a high signal of the sensor precedes contraction. So this can very nicely see if the sensor is uh, giving a high signal, then subsequently the cell will retract. And also a low threat state of the sensor, because it is antagonistic with ROC, uh, is predictive of cell expansion. And so you can really look for a long time as these single cellular gradients. So only look at single. So these are two cells, also two cells. This is one cell. Uh, that there are gradients of activity in these small GTPAs is found in the cells, and they control uh, cellular migration in uh, in mammalian cells. And this is highly intriguing how these kind of signaling pathways work and how these gradients can be achieved. And, of, and they then subsequently signal to the actin cytoskeleton. And we are very much intrigued in this. And of course, you need all sorts of tr microscope tricks and sensors in order to read that out. But this is just fantastic that you can see this uh, with, uh, with Fred. So I can highly recommend uh, this paper if you want to look some tricks to make your own sensors or utilize what's around. For instance, just for kin visualization of kinase activity. So you can have certain um, kinases that um, uh, when active go to the membrane 
or uh, translocate to the nucleus, uh, like certain MAP kinases do that, so they get phosphorylated and then they move to the nucleus. Uh, but there are also, uh, for instance, FRET sensors that you can make, a similar strategy as we saw before in the Gibberellin uh, and also the, the ABBA sensor, uh, that you have a sensing domain, which can be phosphorylated and then you can, uh, yeah, by a kinase, you can uh, get FRET and there are all sorts of tricks and, and things that you can do. I consider this like a Lego kit and uh, there are many ingredients that you can take and swap out and, and try your, uh, to build your own uh, specific sensor. And of course, it's better to first look around if the sensor already has been created by somebody else. That saves a lot of work, but in principle, it's doable. And in, uh, if I have a little bit of time, I want to go into the chemical uh, um, uh, heterodimerization, which can be used to lo uh, change location of proteins. So this is uh, a rapamycin um, induced heterodimerization, small molecule heterodimerization. So it's two proteins that interact or form an, a, a very stable heterodimer, but only in the presence of this small molecule rapamycin. Here you see the structure. It's nice, by the way, that this is cell permeant. So you can just add it to cells and it will be taken up. And what you can do, for instance, is you can uh, fuse this FRB part of this heterodimer to a red fluorescent protein and a tail which is attached to the uh, mitochondrion. This is basically kind of a bait protein. And then your prey protein, you can of course also visualize with GFP tech, FKBP, but this can also have any target protein you would like to study. Yeah? Then um, you can add the rapamycin to the cells and then you will force this heterodimerization and this will uh, lead to recruitment of your, uh, your prey protein towards the, um, the surface of the mitochondria. And this is very powerful because you could use this as a kind of intracellular pull down. Because if you would have a protein, another protein that happens to interact with your target protein, you can also put a nice color on that if you want, then it will migrate together with your uh, uh, target protein to the, micro, uh, to the mitochondria. So you don't even need FRET then to detect protein-protein interaction. It would be a kind of single cell based pull down uh, to look at affinity between proteins. You can even see how, uh, yeah, so how fast it is recruited to the uh, mitochondria. Okay, I will just show this. Uh, this is then uh, in mammalian cells we put the, 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 the bait so, uh, with FRB part to my, mitochondria and we labeled it with CFP. So you see nice cyan fluorescent mitochondria in the cell and the, 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 the prey is um, uh, completely cytosolic also in the nucleus and it's just cherry. So this is no real biology experiment. It's just fun to try to, uh, to see if we could recruit this protein to the mitochondria if we add the rapamycin. So I can play the movie and then if we add the rapamycin, you can see this very nice translocation or relocalization, I should say, from the cytoplasm to the surface of the mitochondria. But it's also interesting that the nucleoplasm does not participate. So these proteins remain uh, dissolved in the nucleoplasm. And you can see that they very slowly move out also to the cytosol and then subsequently, of course, get also trapped to the mitochondria. But this is very nice. You can even see some threat for the specialist because the CFP is slightly quenched by the cherry uh, protein uh, if it is recruited to the surface. Okay, uh, so that's very nice, but you can also use it for more interesting experiments. For instance, if we do the same trick, but then get a guanyl exchange factor, which is uh, attached to the prey, uh, to F, uh, to, to, so to the FKBP12 subunit. If we then add rapamycin, you will recruit this entire thing to the membrane. So normally then in the absence of the rapamycin, the guanyl exchange factor is just cytoplasmic and not able to reach the role, which is, uh, uh, has a lipid tail and is act, uh, present at the membrane. But when we add the rapamycin, we will recruit the, the GEF to the plasma membrane and there it activates ROC 
signaling. And you can see just by shifting the GAF by rapamycin to the membrane, you induce a massive actin polymerization and membrane ruffling of this cell. So there is no post-translational modification, no protein synthesis, no gene expression, just relocalization can trigger signaling, which I think is highly interesting. And that's also why these kind of spatially uh, yeah, uh, confined interactions are of interest. So you can also see that it has an effect, for instance, on transcription factors. Here's the same experiment. Now we recruit a, also a GAF, a, or, but just the BH uh, domain part of the to the membrane. You can see it's first cytoplasmic, and then it moves to the membrane with the same LCK uh, bait protein, which is plasma membrane localized. So you, this is the same as what we saw before, but now downstream in the cascade, so downstream of the small GTPase, we have a transcription factor, the mal transcription factor fused to YFP, which then is seen that as a, res uh, as a result of the signaling that is going on at the plasma membrane, will be translocating from the cytoplasm to the nucleus, where it can then activate genes. So we'll uh, then start the transcriptional process. So this is just to show you that just relocalization of a protein moving from the cytoplasm to the membrane can trigger a signaling cascade leading to gene expression. Yes? So localization really matters. It's not just levels or concentrations. It's also where the molecules are sitting is important for signaling. And a very much exquisite tool that has recently added is this blue light sensitive love domains that are plant based. So that's what plants use to sense whether it's day or night and uh, so, uh, also circadian rhythms and also even uh, uh, yeah, phototropism can be regulated by these love domain uh, proteins. And uh, so uh, the interesting thing is that this has been utilized that, that in the presence of blue light then this undergoes a conformation. It's a flavin cofactor that is bound. And then this alpha helix is getting unfolded in a, in, in a different conformation in the presence of blue light. So several optogenetic systems have been derived from that. So called eyelid or tulip or no, so please refer to this review paper if you want to know more about it. Then, um, so they, they, uh, in the eyelid system that we are uh, using uh, quite a lot and we, are, we like it a lot, is that there is an SSRA peptide added to this uh, alpha helix and this interacts with SSPB. Right? So this is basically, again, your bait and this is your prey then. And this only in the unfolded state, in the presence of blue light, is able the SSRA can bind to the SSPB. So you basically have now a light-induced heterodimerization that you can use. And for the rest, it's uh, conceptually the same as the chemical-induced dimerization, but this can be much more elegant, uh, triggered by blue light. And nicely, if you switch off the light, the, the flavin will go back to the original orientation and you will reverse uh, the system back to the unbound state. So it's reversible. And to just show you, this is the exact similar experiment as I showed you before, but now with optogenetics. So we have the love domain at the membrane, the bait, so it's inactive, there's no light. The GEF is floating around, it cannot reach its target. And we labeled the, the GEF, so we can see the GEF in the cells. And uh, now, uh, so is, this is in the dark, but after we add blue light, then we recruit the GIF by optogenetics to the membrane where it can find the rock. And if we do that, you can see that only where you shine the light, so in this square, you will see the cell expand. Eh? There's actin polymerization. So it's only relocalizing a guanyl exchange factor, which then triggers the downstream uh, rock, which is not uh, altered, so which is present at indigenous uh, levels. And you can just go on and illuminate another part of the cell. You can see this is then reversed and you can see that there is a polymerization occurring there. So this is extremely interesting also to, uh, uh, yeah, you can go to the next cell and to the next cell, to the next cell for that. Uh, and uh, as opposed to chemical stimulation where all the cells in your dish will have responded. And uh, so it's really nice for modulating uh, signaling processes. And think about the Lego kit now that is available for studying 
cellular signaling with all these nice fresh and protein sensors that have been described, but also these tricks in moving back and forth your proteins to a specific location, specific organelle or whatever, you can just choose it by uh, creating the right blocks. So I think uh, this will really speed up uh, subcellular signaling and, and all sorts of spatial control processes very soon and already is doing so in cell biology. So with that, I would like to end with thanking my collaborators, of course, Joachim Goethart, um, who you can see standing uh, uh, over there. This is Joachim and, and, and the rest of the crew. So thank you very much. Thank you, Doris. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, so I think we're coming up on the hour, but hopefully um, if our speakers are happy to, to stay around for a few minutes, we can go through a few questions. I will pass over to uh, Professor Jim Hasloff, um, who for anyone who, who doesn't know Jim, is a Professor of Plant Sciences here at the University of Cambridge and is uh, one of the chairs of the Synthetic Biology uh, Research Centre. So Jim, are you there? Yeah, thanks, Steph. Thank you both, uh, Jim and Doris, for great talks, packed full of really useful information, I'm sure. And that I can see we've already got a question queued up in the Q&A. I've never used cell-free extracts, but... Um... I can add from our side that we've been doing quite a lot of work with uh, E. coli cell-free extracts, mm -hmm. uh, and GFP is, or there's actually a, a deleted form of GFP that comes from Vincent Noirot's lab, which is actually the, the marker of choice um, for um, quantitative work in, in uh, cell-free extracts there, at least in E. coli. Doris, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Well, I've not so much uh, worked with cell extracts too, uh, too but if you, um, so for certain sensors, indeed you need um, eukaryotic systems, but if you can, produce recombinant sensors, you can do whatever you like with them, uh, I guess. Yeah? And then you know, they're you know, with his text or so, it's very easy to calibrate them, et cetera. That's what we do a lot. Well, as to uh, quantum yields, um, that the quantum yield is just a definition. Uh, the definition of quantum yield is um, how many emission photons you get out of a fluor four per absorbed photon. So this can be maximally 100% and minimally zero. Eh? So uh, it's just the efficiency of fluorescence. And in the um, excited state, so if, you, if the molecule is uh, excited, um, then there are basically two pathways down. One is uh, the, the emission of a photon. The other is a non-radiative pathway. And I think in most uh, of the low quantum yield fluor force, there is some sort of vibrational motion or some sort of collision with other amino acids that takes out the energy from the excited state. And then it just gets out of the system in forms of heat dissipation. And of course, you want to minimize that. And so I have not worked on RNA optomers, uh, but I guess the, the, the entire thing would be the same is to try to get your RNA tertiary structure in such a way that it ideally freezes, stabilizes your fluor for, so that it can only, uh, so that there is no, so you, some of these fluor for, they can show a cis trans isomerization. For instance, the quantum yield of the fluor for of a fluorescent protein, if you make this synthetically, is zero, because immediately if you excite it, it will do a cis trans isomerization. And then that takes all out all the energy. But if you freeze the, the two rings yeah, in the fluorescent protein, quantum yield will be high. And I guess that could be used also for these RNA optimers to have uh, yeah, a close to quantum yield one situation if it perfectly fits into a cavity created by RNA, and then, um, yeah, will will only, uh, yeah, in that cavity have a, a completely frozen, um, yeah, situation. So I guess that could boil down to the same. But what you need to tweak in terms of three D structures, that I don't know. I have a question also about. Um... 
the, the, the nature of the fret pairs. And clearly for some applications, I think both of you touched on it in a way, um, what, some of the issues is the cost of the light sources and the arrangement of the microscope. And there are some relatively cheaper versus more expensive sources for lasers and LEDs. And clearly if you move towards a blue laser and there's various low co lower cost green and other lasers, do you th could you recommend or see a way towards, um, say, optimized fret sensors for low cost light sources? Whether you knew of any work in that area or the, the likelihood of that, um, maybe Jim and Doris, you probably have a different view on that. Okay, Jim, you go first. <laughs> um, I I think I think that's where the field should be going. I think this um, like this constructing your own equipment for low cost like there's no reason we should be paying uh, like there's no reason you need the highest spec microscope in the world to be able to do your assays and stuff like that and as long as you've got um certainly for some of the sensors that we're using where you have really big ratio changes um so large signal to noise differences um like um as long as you've got sensitive enough detectors you should be able to um detect that sort of thing and you can get um you can now get leds um, that are incredibly bright for not much money at all and um, there's a lot of people in our lab wiring things together on their benches to do either optogenetic assays or to be uh, or to do um, microscopy uh, screening or whatever but we um, at the moment we're not making the uh, big low-cost microscope transition here but i think i think it is the future and maybe I could just frame the question, focus the question a little bit more, maybe for Doris. <clears throat> so in terms of low cost light sources, the 470 nanometer range, 470, 488 nanometer range seems quite well suited to GFP, for example. And the question again, I guess, is the acceptor for the output of the GFP. Is, is that the way you would see it, Doris, as the, the main limitation at this point? I, I think uh, there is such a huge development in light source uh, right now. So really my advice is to, uh, to take the best biosensor and, and, and try to tweak your microscope to, uh, to accommodate it rather than the other way around. And there are, of course, some of the more fancy uh, microscopes have now these tunable lasers. Eh? So uh, you can... Uh, so I've seen the latest uh, Leica Stellaris, uh, or that they sell now a white light laser that incorporates the important 440 nanometer range. So you can go from 440 to over 700 nanometers. So you don't have to worry at all uh, what color of excitation you need. And spectrally, you also are completely free in these high-end confocals. But for uh, more uh, moderate equipment, so I remember uh, when we re moved in uh, in 2010 uh, to the new building in Amsterdam, we installed a special laser room and you had these huge lasers which needed air cooling. And now we have these little matchbox size uh, little things. They, they don't consume any special power. You just plug them in. And this is how it should be. It's a light bulb. I always found there was much too much emphasis in uh, advanced microscopy sites on the on the light source uh, uh, issue is starting to become rather trivial. And yeah, okay, these lasers you can buy for 4,000, 5,000 euros or something per color. And come on, this is, okay, it's nice if you would have this as personal money, but it's not like a limiting cost for a, a, a lab anymore, I guess. And then, in most of the low end microscopes, you can build in filter sets or filters that really are very nicely developed by, uh, yeah, by Semrock or Chroma, or nice firms. And then they, they basically, if you tell them also what kind of probes you want to image, they even have special solutions for you. And they know all the laser sources and light sources that are around. So uh, indeed the facility managers, they, uh, as they refer to by Jim also, they, they know, uh, they should know these things. And uh, indeed it makes a bit of effort sometimes to move from the standard uh, sets that have been used for years to make this adaptation. So you should bit tweak these managers perhaps to do something extra for you, which is kind of a thing. 
uh, and uh, but but yeah, I I think this is really doable for all the colors basically. And I didn't cover yet the new infrared proteins, and they're also of course very interesting. The the developments in the to the far red uh, probes uh, that uh, perhaps that's a bit more problematic in plants with all the the the, the chlorophyll fluorescence. But if you happen to work in roots, it should be still relatively okay, I guess. But this is so nice. I've seen very nice developments at the 720 nanometer range. It's all new colors that you can add. And there are very nice lasers also that can excite these very low costs. Yeah, I was actually thinking of a much lower cost microscope or optical system. I mean, we have the luxury of white light lasers and hybrid detectors and all the rest of it. And of course, the costs of maintaining those. But there's a number of us, I see Fernand Federici's on the call as well, uh, who've been working with very low cost instruments, which are in the hundreds rather than the thousands. And it does seem that, you know, you, the RGB lasers are accessible and low cost, very low cost LED sources are accessible. It does seem there's an opening in the market for some fret sensors or um, that could tap into that as diagnostics, but I guess we'll, we'll, time will tell. What's been impressive so far is the, uh, the rate at which things have moved recently. I'm an old person, so I remember the, the excitement in the mid to late nineties when Roger Chen's lab was generating these, these new first variants of GFP and the, the then excitement about having um, new uh, rapid responding fluorescent sensors. And it's really taken 20 years on top of that. And now it looks very exciting. I think it's where we hoped we would be um, way back then. So uh, there are very expensive tools. There are very cheap tools. So um, like, you can certainly do a lot of stuff in things like Imeris and things like that, which can solve most of the problems people have. Fiji and the extendability that uh, has come from the fact that anyone can write plugins for it has become um, massively important in the whole community. And like um, when I was developing tools, I, like, I was only gonna put them in one place because, um, because that's what everyone is using. Um, but I think in the next few years, people are going to be moving to, more towards things like Napari and Ice. Ice is a great resource as well and stuff like that. There's a lot of image stuff out there um, for advanced analysis. And uh, the image analysis field is really going through a new renaissance, um, particularly deep learning methods and things like that. Um, if, you're inter if, you, if you have more specific things, then I... I probably give you some recommendations but I like you just have to look in, in general uh, quite often people have written the tool that you want already <laughs> yeah yeah I can Good second question. it so I, I think for uh, just starting the 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 Fiji or image J is I think very fantastic uh, what I like very much is the recording option so if you are not very familiar with uh, the language of image processing, you can just click some steps like uh, select the background or subtract it or multiply two images or something like that. And then you can see also the code appearing on a separate screen. And then uh, it's sometimes if you just do, uh, for instance, like 10 steps eh? and, and always the same 10 steps in every image, then already it makes sense to record such a macro and repeat it. And then you will become enthusiastic also about the image processing pipeline, which is then still small, but it will work and even help you. And then there's so much available online uh, that uh, it can help you. What I want to mention in addition is the Euro Bioimaging uh, Network, to which also the UK is uh, connected. And uh, Jason Svetlov uh, is from University of uh, Dundee effort in that. And it is that there is, of course, next to Image J uh, and, and these things, there are a variety of software codes uh, available. Um, but there is a, also an effort in data handling, annotation, metadata that is starting to become more and more uh, important. And we are defining that still in Europe. So there is not a completely global solution to that yet. And I guess for image processing, we are also thinking about how can we somehow make this 
publicly available or uh, searchable, what is the best algorithm for solving what problem? And to make a kind of European distributed ecosystem around that. So not to reinvent the wheel all the time, because that sometimes still happens in labs where there's a brilliant programmer, a postdoc, he, he can solve all your problems until he leaves for the, for the next job. Yeah. <laughs> We've all seen that, but that's a shame. And uh, uh, that, that uh, but it really does help. And I see for biologists, especially, there is a kind of still bit of hesitation to go into computer programming and this quantitative stuff. Try to make that step. It will bring you so much but you don't need to do that overnight. There is time and when you get more and more experience, you will be able to do it because my uh, simple statement with respect to quantitative things and programming, biology is infinitely more complex than programming a computer. So that's why it, does, it can really help and can be beneficial to do it, uh, to, to, to invest a bit in image processing. And there are very expensive programs and also artificial, artificial intelligence is coming up for annotation, segmentation, but there is not yet kind of a gold standard. And it indeed would be perhaps even not good to invest a lot of money in it now because it's still developing as far as I'm concerned. And so it's better to watch out and to be a bit aware of things and, and then invest huge sums of money in certain packages right now. Yeah. Yeah, um, I've not really focused on that much. Um, all of our stuff, we do, yeah, all of our stuff is pretty much genetically encoded. Um, uh, so I, yeah. Um, I guess for a lot of um, less uh, conventional, you might say, thinking you might stick to fluids rather than um, genetically encoded fluorescent proteins. So there's probably a, a, a collision required between two different fields here that there's a lot of chemical labeling um, which gives you a lot more flexibility in terms of chemistry uh, but I guess the genetic side of it has the ability to be intrinsic inside the organism and of course it's cheap you know in terms of the cost of the thing and it's working inside the living system so maybe there's a more work required to try and integrate those two two broad approaches yeah, so yeah. also my advice would be uh, to just use the standard uh, chemical fluor force for DNA labeling or antibody labeling. That's much cheaper. And you can have fluor force that are really have extremely high economy yields and, and, and absorbance are very good performing in microscopes. But if you want to um, really make a GFP labeled uh, antibody, I would also recommend the nanobody technique. So there are many nanobodies available right now to, for which you can very easily fuse an FP to it. So for threat uh, uh, sensing, this is, uh, yeah, CFP, YFP is well known. And we have uh, really tried to push this and I'm really busy with that to try to push it also to the red. So to also get the yellow to red fluorescent protein threat. So we published uh, in, in, in many cells also in plant cell systems that this works well. And um, so that you could indeed do multiple threat pairs and, uh, so to make more than one thread pair is uh, yeah, an effort that really uh, is worthwhile because then you can do two of these kind of biosensing events. One of the issues is that you have a lot of spectral uh, overlap and, and issues uh, that you need to solve. And for that, we are also busy to develop chromoproteins that do not uh, fluoresce. So you can use them as acceptor. And then uh, by donor-based techniques, you can still do, uh, you have all these conformational uh, sensing things, but then they only change the quantum yields of the donor. And you can pick that up by simple intens intensity imaging or by uh, lifetime imaging if you want to do it quantitatively. So I think that is also a development that is ongoing to, to multiplex things. But otherwise, uh, if you just have a very good threat pair, I would just stick to it. Uh, there's no reason to, to change. 
but multiplexing may be a reason to change. And also higher wavelengths in general do fret better because of the spectral overlap, which is uh, um, better if you go to higher wavelengths because also the chromophores typically are larger. So the resonance is sensed better if you go to the red. That's why we try to push the yellow to red fluorescent fret pairs because you can fret over larger distances. And this is important for certain protein-protein interactions. I hope that gives an answer to your question. Yeah, I did work on that myself. Uh, so that's the Fakushka lab, uh, which I think most prominent in that. So it's a, a, a Russian guy who sits, uh, who is based in New York uh, right now in America. And he has published fantastic uh, uh, contribution on these infrared uh, processes. They, they have a kind of porphyrin-like moiety in the uh, bilirubin-like moiety in the protein, and they fluoresce in the red. The column yields are not like super, but still there is almost nothing optofluorescing, at least in mammalian cells at that region. So uh, you, you can have really nice images in addition to the, all the other colors uh, and themes. So it's really orthogonal to that. There are, um, there are loads available in Python at the moment. Um, I can I can maybe provide a link afterwards, um, but I don't have anything to hand. Um, but there's a lot. I don't I don't know if Doris has any recommendations, but there are there are a lot of courses people have already made using psychic image and things like that. Um, and now um, a lot of there's a there's more and more every week. Yeah, there are, there are even some tutorials for ImageDA itself. If you download the package, you would just, on the ImageDA website, there are some simple tutorials on, uh, on how to start uh, it and, and, and to, to process some standard images that are also provided. You can even, if, if you wanted to use Python, you can code for ImageDA in Jython as, a, um, as the scripting language, which is how I did all of my stuff. Um, but um, yeah, so that's, and um, Albert Cardona um, has a wonderful series of tutorial, a uh, wonderful tutorial on that on the internet as well. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, in terms of good links for the Jupyter Notebooks, I would need to have a look for you, but they are there. Great. Well, thanks again, everybody, especially to our two speakers, uh, Jim and Doris. Um, I also enjoyed it very much and also to be invited uh, through you, uh, Jim, because uh, remember indeed some of these old days where you solved this cryptic intron thing in the GFB and, and things were, yeah, where, look where we are now. It's still, it's amazing. Uh, it's amazing. And I think uh, a lot of the scient young scientists are, are so lucky that they are born in this age and that they can use all this uh, fancy stuff now. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Cool time. Thank you for inviting me. It was a real honor. Awesome. <laughs> thanks, Jim. And uh, thanks again to everybody. And uh, have a good day. Yes. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye.